afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm Charmini, and I'm the Vice President of Research and International at the University of Waterloo. Before we begin um, tonight's program, I would like to acknowledge that we are living and working on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The museum acknowledges this as well as the University of Waterloo. We are situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations, that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. Welcome to you all. It's such a pleasure seeing such a full house today. We had a, a, another event at, from the University of Waterloo on sustainability as well uh, earlier this week, two days ago, and it was also a packed house. That event was mostly for the community. This event is mixed between the community and the University of Waterloo. And there were so many enthusiastic individuals in the audience who had so many great ideas about what we should be doing as an institution and what the community should be doing in order to support the changes or you know, ev help eradicate some of the effects that we're seeing. So great to have a full audience again tonight. This is such an important topic. Uh, so the ideas to shape the future Fighting Climate Change is an event that is hosted by two of the university's institutes. So we have faculties at the institution, and faculties house disciplinary um, endeavors, so mathematics and engineering. But we also have institutes, and institutes are where some of the big interdisciplinary ideas thrive how big interdisciplinary problems are considered and solved at the institution. And the two institutes that are hosting tonight's event are the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change and the Water Institute, two of our premier institutes at the University of Waterloo. Climate change, as you know, is defining uh, one of the big challenges of the 21st century. And in recent times, in the last election, the federal election, and also uh, in conversations here in the city and elsewhere, uh, there's a lot more national and international debates focused on how to tackle this urgent issue. There are so many organizations that are, and people, uh, including you here tonight, who are thinking about the issue and trying to determine how do I contribute? How do I help con the world contribute in this important conversation? Two days ago, we heard so many people saying, there's just so much out there on this topic. How do we actually come to grapple with it? Can the university give us some tools to really understand what are the, what are the ways that as an individual we can contribute? What are the, what's the right and the wrong here? Um, uh, what's, I have a debate on a particular item, how can I bring that forward? So lots of interesting conversations about everything that's out there and how difficult it is to navigate the space. So it's such a thrill that the leaders of the two in main institutes, two major institutes at the institution, are coming to grips with this and helping us by defining some key problems and talking about them tonight. So we are home at the university to countless faculty, students, programs that are really working on accelerating climate change action and research across the country. So the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change is a focal point for climate change research, for its information, and for education. So if ever you want, uh, you have a question about that, don't hesitate to reach out to the executive director or the individuals at the center for questions. It's an interdisciplinary hub. There are members from all across campus. All of our six university faculties are focused on this issue from, um, you know, from water, cleaning water, all the way to sustainable solutions for energy to monitoring climate. And there are also several external organizations. As you know, at Waterloo, we're very much interested in partnering with the external community. And so we have many external organizations also working with this institute. The Water Institute 
is actually breaking boundaries in water research. They provide a forum not just for research, but for education and training in water, water monitoring, water uh, as a policy issue. So tonight's speakers are leading experts from both of these institutes. I hope that it is a unique learning opportunity and it's an interesting one for you and we we'll welcome your feedback after this. And if there are other ways that the institution can be working with you to support any ideas that you have that you would really like teased out through a community event like this, we're, we're very pleased to hear about this and to make it happen for you. So I'll leave you in the hands now of the Executive Director of our Water Institute, Roy Brown. Thank you very much, Charmaine. So my name is Roy Brown. I'm the Director of the Water Institute, as Charmaine said. And I know from behalf of Professor Dan Scott, the Executive Director of the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change at the University of Waterloo, it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. It's not so long ago that I used to live in a place that was located four meters below sea level. And as a result of climate change, there was more and more water rolling down the rivers. Um, the land in which we were living was, uh, was actually sinking. The dikes that we were building there were sinking as well. And there's sea level rise. So you can imagine how excited I am about the, the evening that we are organizing here tonight. As Charmaine noted, the University of Waterloo and its Water and Climate Change Research Institute are at the forefront of research and teaching programs that aim to understand and predict the potential impacts of our changing climate on our environments, our economies, and our communities. And importantly, we're also trying to identify novel approaches how to deal with these impacts in the future by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, for example, in the atmosphere, or in adapting to climate change impacts that are already there or that are expected to occur in the near future. Tonight, we're happy to have with us seven researchers. You can see their faces here um, and behind me. We're making a real difference in understanding and addressing climate change. And we have a lot of set, set these seven researchers seven minutes each uh, to share their ideas on how we as a country, as a community, or as an individual can respond to the challenges posed by climate change. So without further ado, I'm delighted to share with you a short introduction to our seven speakers in the order that they will take the stage. The first speaker here, the first one here on the, on the, um, on the slide is uh, Marek Stasna. Marek is a professor of applied mathematics and he's the vice president of the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. Marek's research focuses on the modeling of physical processes in lakes and the coastal ocean under climate change, from complex global climate models to simplistic toy models. The second speaker, um, the, uh, here on the left as well, is Kirsten Müller. Kirsten is a professor of biology who studies algae in lakes, rivers, and oceans, and is passionate about engaging people on how climate change affects these ecosystems. In 2019, Kirsten was chosen as one of only four Canadians to be part of a year-long leadership initiative for women in science and technology called Homeward Bound, and she will talk about that. And she went on an all-female scientists expedition to Antarctica together with 99 other scientists uh, around the world to first-hand see the impact of climate change. The third speaker is Rebecca Sari. Rebecca is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, and she's an internationally recognized expert in assessing the health and economic benefits of improved air quality as a result of policies that are designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Rebecca works with policymakers such as Ontario Public Health Units, Health Canada, and the World Health Organization. The fourth speaker is Kelly Skinner. Kelly is a professor of public health and health systems, and her research focuses on food security and climate change. Kelly works on this topic in direct collaboration with indigenous communities both in the Canadian North and in urban areas. The fifth speaker is Luna Kirfar. Luna is a professor of planning, and also Luna's research emphasizes the importance of a community engagement in community planning. Luna's research focuses on the impact of daylighting or the uncovering of urban streams for climate change adaptation and mitigation. The sixth speaker is Jason Tisukwey. Jason is a professor in the Department of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo, and his research focuses on the risks of flooding, including the construction of 3D visualizations of flood risks, understanding the social vulnerability, and developing strategies to inform the government about effective risk management. 
And finally, we've got Imre Zeman, a professor of communication arts. His research focuses on the social and cultural changes that will need to take place to enable energy transitions and address climate change. So a very wide spectrum of visions uh, and expertise here tonight um, sharing their research um, um, uh, experiences with us. So with that, I would like to invite, first of all, Professor Marek Stasny to the stage. coast of Labrador, and what you see is land over here, you see sea over here, and in between you see the ice edge. And if you look at the ice edge, and you look at it now, tomorrow, most other days, what you would see are these, these sort of mushroom-like structures. They wouldn't always be the same, but they would always kind of have the same shape. This one over here, this one over here, this one over here, say. And if you were a little tiny plankton, which with 10 million of your friends in just this area over here, then what you would see is, oh, pardon me, what you would see is influenced by these structures, okay, because these structures might cover you with ice, or might bring in cold water or warm water, okay, so these coherent structures determine how living creatures like us, or like plankton, or fish, or animals, really are affected by climate change. So here's a more familiar slide for those of you who are interested in climate change. These black slides are everywhere. Here we go. So this is the sort of typical stuff that the IPCC puts out, right? So these are our collections of models, and here are the results for the global average surface temperatures from a collection of models. It's tiny, it's like 39 of them, okay? And then what this says is, is if we don't do anything, the global temperature goes up. But it's very, very difficult to get an idea of what that means for us as individuals. Okay? Because you very rarely experience the average of anything. You experience particular events. So let's have a look at the scales of environmental flows that I'm interested in. We're going to start at the large and go to the small. And the common story here is that there's a certain kind of pattern at each of these scales that your eyes is drawn to. So if we go at the tiny scales, this is an engineering scale flow of a jet in a lab, and you see something that looks a lot like that stuff I showed you in the Labrador Sea. Here's a picture of the North Pacific when it's kind of angry, and you see all these white caps, and again, coherent structures, and if you've been out in a, in a canoe, say, on a windy day, you would see some of the smaller white caps in very persistent patterns. Here's one that's far prettier, it's a lenticular cloud you might see on a beautiful summer day. Again, clouds have particular shapes that you see not exactly the same, but similar over and over again. Here's a much larger scale flow, this is a picture from space, of the Gulf Stream, okay, and again, you see the Gulf Stream meandering, this is Florida, this is Cuba, it's warm, so this is the red part here, it comes up here and it just starts to kind of change and meander and change into these, again, coherent structures, these eddies. And here's a rather fearsome one that I'm going to spend some time talking about, a hurricane. And if you think about the scales of these features, you started at about a meter, and you went to 10 meters, a kilometer to 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers to 100 kilometers, and then greater than 1,000 kilometers. So there's this real persistence of pattern, and one of the things we try to do in modern mathematics is describe that pattern. Okay, so here's a picture of Hurricane Katrina. I think everybody knows about Hurricane Katrina. This is an image from NOAA, so it's an American image. They're very, very good at sharing a lot of their data publicly. And you see some persistent features associated with hurricanes. So for example, here you see the eye wall, and here's the eye. Every major hurricane has one of these. And then you see kind of this pattern of sort of arms of the hurricane, right, which might bring clouds and rain as you go around. So again, every hurricane is different. Not every hurricane is, is as destructive as Katrina, but all of them have certain common features. And that's what we would seek to describe mathematically. Okay? And so we don't really know how hurricane incidence is going to change as climate changes. That's one of those things that's still scientifically controversial. 
right? But we do know things about trends. So if you think about those IPCC, very dry kind of, of pictures, right? Um, this is a, a somewhat more, a prettier or more dynamic picture. What it shows is that what we expect to happen is the surface of the ocean is going to warm, okay? And in particular, it's going to warm along the coast of North America, and it's going to warm more if you look around Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Okay, so Nova Scotia and Newfoundland are not places where hurricanes form. They form somewhere down here. Okay, they travel across, they build, and then they have a number of different paths they can take. But if you see this image, right, regardless of how you feel about hurricane incidents and climate change, what you conclude is that what a hurricane going north will encounter is a lot more warm water. Okay, and that's bad news, right, because a hurricane feeds on warm water to drive itself. So by the time a hurricane gets to Nova Scotia, it's usually just a very long-lasting, very windy rainstorm. But this says it's going to be even stronger, and even the ones that we've experienced, right? So I was um, in Nova Scotia after one of the big hurricanes came through, and I went down to the, to the park to see all the trees that got destroyed, and then there, was, there were quite a few um, recently that have come through Newfoundland as, as sort of leftovers of hurricanes, and we would expect these to be larger than the so there are certain things we can, based on these ideas of climate change and the ideas of these persistent coherent structures, make some conclusions. So here's a more local picture. I, I like to cover both air and water. This is a picture of Lake Erie. We would be up here, okay, in Kitchener. I grew up down here in Windsor, right? And this is a spring algal bloom, again, from satellite. And these green patterns over here, they kind of look more or less the same every year. There's some of those swirls, like you saw on the ice, some more complicated things, because remember, these are many, many living things here form this algal bloom. And the practical uh, consequences of algal bloom might be, if it gets really bad, like down here in Cleveland, they might have to shut the water intakes, okay? And this whole idea of coherent structures, on average, you could say algal blooms do one thing, but it doesn't really matter what the average is. It matters whether you have to shut down the water intakes here. Or, where I used to spend a lot of my youth in Rondo for Mitchell Park, if you want a cottage there, and there's an algal bloom, they have to close the beach, that might be the week you so those are the consequences on us as people. It's not the averages that matter, it's these persistent, coherent structures. Okay. okay, now here's my professional world. These are waves inside the ocean and lakes. So this is a picture off the coast of Portugal. And again, these won't matter so much for people, but no matter what, if you're a fish, and so these are called internal waves, because they happen in the inside of the ocean. And you can't really see it very much here, but, but they're about 25 meters tall in this picture in water that's seven, about 70 meters deep. So you think waves are big? Ooh, okay. All right, let me finish with the slide then. Um, these are very large waves, and they're, they're coherent. Again, they, they can propagate well over 1,000 kilometers. So let me finish with something about climate change and, and my feelings about it. So this is just the, the main point I was trying to make. And mathematics doesn't really say a lot about how we should uh, sort of approach the political side of things. But as many of you will know, Waterloo Mathematics is the land of the Trekkies. I thought Mr. Spock's dictum of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few is a very good way to think about climate change. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here today, and thank you to Roy for the introduction. Um, so I uh, spent the last 20 years of my career studying algae, studying the distribution of algae in freshwaters and also in marine habitats. And I've been very interested in looking at invasive species and also looking at the impact on climate and how it affects the distribution of seaweeds. However, recently I have shifted my focus to look at the impact of forest fires on rivers and lakes. And Merrick showed you in a slide a few minutes ago about the potential of algal blooms. Now, this is of personal interest to me because I grew up in Fort McMurray and in 2016, I watched as my hometown of Fort McMurray burned. And it was very hard to sit in Waterloo and watch that happen. And that really caused a personal shift for me to start looking at algal blooms in a different way. And what we know about forest fires and the impact of climate change and the connection with forest fires is that they can actually result in algal blooms that we then see in our rivers and lakes. And I have this shown here. So this is a nuisance algal bloom that would cause a real fishy taste to drinking water. And this is a toxic algal bloom, very similar to the picture that Merrick showed. And if you drank this water, you could do damage to your liver. 
So algal blooms are tending to be a problem when it comes to forest fires. However, this interest in climate change is what led to me, led me to the program that Roy mentioned earlier, and that's what I'm really going to talk about today. So in 2019, I was selected to be part of this program, which is called Homeward Bound. It's a not-for-profit in Australia. And I was one of four Canadians, one of 99 women that went from 34 different countries. And these women ranged from graduate students to engineers, to faculty members at universities, to members of the World Bank, to women in the mining industry, and even to medical doctors. And we all did this leadership program because we were interested on the impacts of climate change on our communities, on our families, and on our countries. And this program, year-long, culminated in a three-week voyage to Antarctica. So why would we go to Antarctica? Well, if any of you have read up on Antarctica, you might know names like Shackleton, Scott, Amundsen, or McWinney, who was a woman who was the first female to actually run McMurdo Station. All of these people were leaders in their time, and they understood how important community was, and they also understood how important leadership was in the expeditions or the stations that they ran. We also know that Antarctica, was, the Treaty for Antarctica was established in 1959. This continent was set aside for peace, international collaboration, and scientific investigation. So where else could we go to really understand how leadership fits in the context of, of scientific discovery? We also know that it's our polar regions, the Antarctic and the Antarctic, which are greatly affected by greenhouse gases that are coming from mid-latitudes and also diffuse sources of pollutants that are also coming from mid-latitudes. There are also more direct human impacts, which include unregulated tourism that are bringing non-native species to Antarctica. And this displaces natural species that occur there. When we were in Antarctica, we saw over 50 different species of organisms. I could probably tack on a few seaweeds that I actually identified while I was there as well. And one of the things that really struck us was the biological diversity of Antarctica is really incredible, and you can see this on this slide. But one of the things we also noted is that a lot of these species are likely to go extinct in our grandchildren's time. And so the species that are no longer present on this slide are the ones that will no longer be there, and they're at risk of going extinct right now. We also spent a lot of time sitting in zodiacs, sitting on the shore. We could hear glaciers cracking and melting. You can see a piece of a glacier falling right here. We also spoke to many scientists at research stations about how the impact of sea ice is actually affecting what they study in Antarctica. And there was a lot of feelings about what we were actually seeing. And you might expect that we would come away with a sense of hopelessness. But this program was not about this. This program was to create leaders in all of us and give us the tools that we needed. And here's just a few images of some of the women and some of the work that we were doing on the ship. So we talked about what does authentic leadership look like? What are our values? How can we use our values to engage others? How can we create programs, policies, systemic change within our communities, our institutions, and even our countries? So this brings me the two things that I want to share with you today that I took away from the program, not all of them. I've probably got a list of about 20, but I only have time to really share two. And the first thing I want to mention is values and how important our personal values are in engaging others when it comes to change. So if we can be leaders and we can lead with authenticity and we can engage others in discussion, then we can motivate change in the people around us. And a really good example of this is we all came away from Antarctica thinking we needed to do something to change what was happening. And every woman on that ship has signed on to put forward our names and our collective voices for a new marine protected area that's being proposed in the fall. And you'll, if you follow social media, there'll start to be a media campaign that's coming out uh, behind that. So we're all using our collective voices to actually make change happen in Antarctica. And that's where we brought in our values of making a difference. 
The next thing I wanted to share with you is about stories. We know stories engage people. Storytelling engages people. That's one of the fundamental things about us as a human species, is how important stories are. Now, I can share with you um, a story about the Adeli penguin, which are really beautiful animals, but they have these weird googly eyes. Um, this species is, is being reduced in numbers in Antarctica. Its populations are decreasing dramatically. But I actually want to come back full story here, right back around to what I started with today, and that was about forest fires. Now, one third of the women on the ship at home were bound to call Australia home. And they got off the ship in December to find out their families had been evacuated, because we had no contact with the outside world, that their families had been evacuated and that their communities were at risk. And I think that was a huge impact on them. And this is actually, I know our news here is not reporting it as much, but this is actually a pyrocumulonimbus cloud or a cloud caused by forest fires that's really close to one of my now friends in Australia. And what we are doing now is Australian scientists and all the women that are part of Homeward Bound are engaging on the political landscape to actually make a difference. And through me and other people in North America, we're now engaging our scientific societies so that we can send letters to the Australian government about the impact of forest fires. So we continue to use the values and the stories that we learn and we heard from each other on the ship. And so one of the things that I leave you with today is think about the values that you can use to engage other people and listen deeply to the stories that others share with you about the impact of climate change. And thank you very much. That's when we're down. beautiful story taking us from Antarctica to uh, Australia and the wildfires. I'm going to touch on that a little bit because part of the problem with those wildfires which are exacerbated by climate change lead to a lot of air pollution that chokes up our lungs. They are not great for our health. But that's part of what makes climate change, even though it's a global issue, a really personal one. Because regardless of what action we take, what climate policy we adopt, we're going to have to pay for that in some way. We're going to have to change uh, our behavior in some way. And it can be hard for us to know what are the benefits of doing that for me. And the good news I have for you is that it's probably bigger than you think. And that's because when you are fighting climate change, you're also protecting yourself from one of the biggest uh, threats to public health this century. So climate change has pervasive impacts throughout our environment. It affects things like spring events, uh, infectious disease, uh, crop yields, agriculture, and our exposure to pollution, including air pollution. And all of this has a big effect on our health. So what that means, though, is that solutions for climate change yield significant benefits for our health. We call them health co-benefits. Right? And, it, and it makes sense. For example, a low-carbon diet is a healthier diet. Low-carbon active transportation is, is healthier for us. And if we target carbon pollution, we're also targeting air pollution. And that can be really protective for our health. Why? Because air pollution is the one environmental problem, believe it or not, that is killing most of us. We can see that here. This is a list rank order of all of the risk factors that contribute to global uh, premature deaths each year. And if you go down the list, you see a lot of the usual suspects. Things like high blood pressure, smoking, high blood sugar, high body mass index. A lot of this has to do with our behaviors, um, like diet, exercise, risk-taking behavior. But then we get down to number six, and that's outdoor air pollution. Number eight, indoor air pollution. 
And what this means is that air pollution is the leading environmental risk factor contributing to premature death worldwide. About 4 million deaths each year. And those deaths and the associated illnesses, things like lung cancer, asthma, heart attacks, they contribute a drain on our economy to the tune of about $50 billion a year here in Canada. So what that means is when we take efforts to reduce carbon emissions, we are not only protecting ourselves from climate change, but also from uh, health impacts due to air pollution. And we can quantify that. So if we stay on our business as usual case that you saw in uh, Mary's presentation, we expect uh, global deaths due to air pollution to get worse. Here is just in the United States, we expect to see an extra tens of thousands of deaths, thousands of heart attacks, millions of lost work days every year by the end of the century in the US. But if we meet our stated global climate targets, we reduce those risks by about 70%. And we can come up with ways to meet those climate targets that are more cost effective. And if we do that, those air quality co-benefits alone can completely pay for that kind of policy. And we see that here. So for example, here's an entire policy cost in dollars per person. And here we look at adding cooperation across sectors. And the more we cooperate, you know, this is just the transportation sector, just electricity, and then something like an economy-wide price on carbon pollution, which is what we have uh, here in Canada, and the more we bring economic sectors together, the more we bring down costs, and we still see significant air quality health benefits to the point where they can exceed those costs by a factor of 10. So cooperation is great across the economic sectors and also across our borders. So you know, if a state or a province, if they act together to meet a national climate uh, uh, kind of goal, then we see significant cost savings and we get additional health co benefits. At the same time, if your neighbors aren't cooperating, don't wait for them. Uh, your, those health co benefits can still exceed the cost of your own action and contribute to the solution. Uh, here in Ontario, we've already done a lot of work to decarbonize large sections of our economy, uh, but the remaining largest uh, contributor is transportation. And so here we've looked at what are the benefits of uh, introducing green freight in particular. And if we do so, we can avoid about $80,000 in damages per truck. And just a 5% introduction of zero emitting trucks would help us meet our premature climate targets in this sector. And of course, reap lots of air quality benefits for us here locally. So if there's one idea to remember, is that if we design a climate policy that brings more folks together, that encourages more cooperation across sectors, across regions, we can meet our uh, carbon reduction goals more affordably, and we can reap considerable benefits for the planet and for our health. Thank you. A few weeks ago, I was out to dinner with my family, and we happened to get fortune cookies after our meal. And my fortune was, you will always have access to good food. Um, and my background is in public health, food security, and food systems, so this is pretty fitting. In my current life, this feels pretty true. I'm fortunate that I have enough money to buy food for my family. I live in a place where I'm able to purchase healthy food options from the grocery store. And I also live in a place where we have an abundance of farms nearby. I am food secure. And food security exists when people can afford and access enough good, healthy, and culturally appropriate food. However, not everyone living in Canada is so fortunate. 
The prevalence of household food insecurity in northern Canada is much higher than the south. For example, in the Northwest Territories, the rate of household food insecurity is 25 to 30 percent. Climate change impacts food security. For example, warmer temperatures can create drier conditions that impact animal habitat and the growing of food. This past year, our team was successful in securing a large four-year grant to work with six communities in four regions in the Northwest Territories. This project evolved from many years of collaborative work and relationship building. Food systems in the North are a mix of store-bought food flown from the South, country food harvested from the land and waterways, and in some places, small-scale agriculture. This project considers all of these aspects of the Northern food system. And the main aim of our project is to learn from and enhance existing food security and climate adaptation initiatives. And then to share what we've learned to inform climate change and food security action at local, regional, territorial, and national levels. My main message here tonight is this. What can we learn from Northern food systems? How can we use this learning to help maintain our access to good food in the face of climate change? Food systems are defined by place and local circumstances. Northern food systems are based on harvesting of country food through hunting, fishing, and gathering. And food sharing plays a very important role in this food system. Communities have been able to sustain their food systems and thrive for millennia because of their close connections and relationships with the land and water and their understanding of the environment. Traditional knowledge systems based on harvesting practices are tied to the environment. And this knowledge is passed down through generations. This enables younger generations to access the land and provide food for their community. Understanding climate change impacts and adaptation potential in Canada's north is critical since food systems are tightly linked to the health of the environment, the health of community members, and the long-term sustainability of communities. I want to highlight some of the on-the-ground examples of initiatives that we are supporting with communities in the Northwest Territories. One of the ways that we're identifying place-based priorities and how we support community initiatives is through on-the-land camps. This picture is from a camp last August. These camps involve shared on-the-land experiences with both researchers and community members. And the camps create a space for shared learning and a dialogue to identify community needs and priorities. These camps are also a space where land-based skills can be transferred between elders, community members, and youth. For example, learning how to make dry fish which was in the previous picture, and how to prepare other parts of the animal, like the head of the fish, shown here on the right-hand side of the screen. Another example is using alternative types of facilities to process food. This is a food processing trailer in the Northwest Territories. It can provide a specialized space to process food in traditional ways, such as smoking or drying, as well as to preserve local foods through canning, like this canned trout. The trailer also provides an opportunity to process non-traditional local food sources like muskox. And there are now many muskox who are near several Northwest Territories communities where there were not muskox before, which may be an impact of climate change. Some of the communities we work with in the Northwest Territories also want to grow food. With climate change and warming in the North, there's more opportunity for agriculture. Root vegetables like potatoes and carrots can grow in the Northwest Territories where there is good soil, and otherwise they're heavy and expensive to ship if they have to come from the south. The last example I will provide are the potential for food sharing distribution systems within northern regions. Communities that have an abundance of specific foods like fish or have good growing soil and can grow crops can share food with each other. And food can also be distributed regionally through a hub like Yellowknife. Existing established structures like the Yellowknife Farmers Market could be a part of this hub. 
My message is not that you should start hunting and fishing, or even eat local. What I think we can learn from our northern neighbors is to honor the food web and the environment and adapt to change. Know where your food comes from, teach your children and your grandchildren where their food comes from. Share food and resources, spend time outside, acknowledge the connections between your food, the land, and the health of the environment. Be an ally with Indigenous peoples who are fighting to protect the land and waterways and advocate for environmental stewardship. We need to adapt to new ways of living and eating with the climate change impacts on our food systems. Solutions need to be place-based and we need to work together with our families, friends, and communities and advocate for policies to ensure that we will always have access to good food. Thank you. to the water cycle. Because we, as we continue to urbanize, we clean land from water. Land reclamation refers to the practice of acquiring land from water through draining and leveling. It was first practiced for agricultural purposes, but as technologies evolved and as demands for urbanization, for housing, industrial, retail, and commercial uses increased, we continue to um, reclaim land from water. We even reclaimed land from rivers and urban streams. This is downtown Toronto, and you can see that there are 11 rivers buried in this area alone. As we bury these rivers, we are disrupting the water cycle. And by disrupting the water cycle, we trigger urban flooding that is further exacerbated with the extreme events that are ensuing from climate change. Take, for example, the 2013 three-hour rainfall that caused extreme damage uh, to property and infrastructure in downtown Toronto to the amount of nearly a billion dollars in three hours. So in my work, what I try to do is reimagine the urban landscapes by trying to recreate the water cycle within urban form. I try to bring back water into the city, and, and I will present today two examples. The first one is from Charlottetown in Edward Island, and the second one is from the island of Tobago in the Caribbean. In both cases, as it is in all the work that I do, I engage the local communities in interactive, engaging activities that evolve around drawing and dialogues and discussion that we call charades. And through these charades, I gather the local ecological knowledge and fuse it with my own scientific knowledge. In Charlottetown, the local community highlighted to me the areas that are suffering from severe flooding weather from storm surge, or from rainwater runoff. When I overlay these maps that they highlighted with the scientific models, they align perfectly well. If you look at this area in particular, this is one of the areas that suffers from severe flooding 
and it is also the area that has witnessed the most reclamation. The reclamation here is not only from land from the sea, but actually it was completely draining and burying an urban stream that used to run through here and feed into a pond. And that pond is now a parking lot and the stream is buried in culverts underground. So what I do is I propose to transform this area by actually reversing the land reclamation. Instead of reclaiming land from water, I reclaim land for water in the urban landscape. How do I do this? I unearth and uncover the urban stream and deepen it and connect it to a restored and revitalized pond that used to exist and protect the pond and the stream with a bear. Together, the system works to gather and the rainwater runoff from the street network surrounding this area, filter it and replenish the underground water aquifer, which is Charlottetown's only source of fresh water. In fact, most of the residents that I interviewed and worked with highlighted that they suffer from water insecurity during the summer months when the rainwater runoff particularly because the city abounds with concrete and asphalt, what we call impervious hard surfaces, all the rainwater runoff goes into the sea instead of replenishing the underground aquifer. So the urban landscape that looks something like this, with lots of parking lots and hard surfaces, becomes something like this. And from this, it turns into something like this. Just like in Charlottetown, in the island of Tobago, I also learned from the local communities that disruptions to the water cycle are the source of most of the island's vulnerability to climate change. Specifically, because of the longer dry months, the precious wetlands in Tobago are, getting, are being lost. When we lose the wetlands, it becomes like a domino effect. We lose the mangrove trees and the forest that hosts the mangrove trees and we suffer from beach erosion, the coral bleaching follows and the loss of fish habitat comes down. So what I do in Charlottetown, in uh, Tobago, is start at the household scale where every household is equipped with rainwater harvesting tanks and also tanks for recycling rainwater. This water would be used for domestic household uses and also to, for gardening and planting and ensuring food security at the household level. From the household level, we move to the neighborhood and district scale where as the street networks would have these ditches that are enhanced and improved and supported by a network of bioswales all of which connect and redirect all the rainwater runoff to the wetlands. Once we get to the wetlands, there are these biodegradable uh, carpets that host the mangrove uh, fruits and help them to propagate. These biodegradable carpets serve two purposes. Because we make them from bamboo, we are harvesting an invasive species on the island and we help the island get rid of it. But at the same time, they serve an important purpose because the mangrove fruit is very fragile and for it to grow, the local community explained to me that the fruit needs to stay vertical until it hardens and grows into a seedling. So this biodegradable carpet will help the fruit propagate and grow. And then the system would look something like this. We move from the household level to the streets and the bioswales that collect the rainwater runoff, replenish the wetland, grow the mangrove forest, which is protected by a berm from flood surges. And the whole system would look something like this, that is uh, healthy, ecologically, and also beautiful. What I've learned from my experiences in Charlottetown and in uh, Tobago is that disruptions to the water cycle 
are, can be really uh, have very severe repercussions. But I also learned that capitalizing on the local knowledge of the local communities and engaging them in the planning and design process are crucial aspects. Thank you. So I'm going to pick up, uh, pick up a little bit where uh, Luna left off. And the purpose of my talk today is to think about this question. Where will we go when the water comes? To start, I want to show you two images of floods. The first here is Calgary in 2013. This is Canada's most costliest flood to date. The second is a few weeks ago, just along the Grand River uh, by Bridge Street. Uh, I'm out for a walk with my daughter. Now, you can see some similarities with the two flood events here. Water has clearly inundated an area for human settlement and overcome some of the flood defenses. But you can also see an important difference. There's lots of development in the image in Calgary. You see critical infrastructure, tourism, people, and property. In Kitchener, you see none of that. And the point I want to make here is that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. Disasters are the result of poor policy decisions. In Calgary's case, they have proceeded with development in what is a high-risk area prone to flooding. In Kitchener's case, we're fortunate that the Grand River Conservation Area prohibits development in these same areas, new development in these same areas. Now, well, there are exceptions to this, and um, as a consequence of some of these poor policy decisions, we have proceeded to, in fact, develop on over 80% of our cities existing in floodplains in Canada. We are, of course, no, no exception, and it makes sense. This is where we are right here. This is how close we are to the floodplain uh, just to the west of us in Victoria Park. And the reasons for this are justified. Historically, this is access to commerce, access to economic development, and if you want a higher property value, you may choose to live near the waterfront as well, which explains why one in five Canadian households are now currently at risk from flooding. Historically, this type of development was often rewarded. What we did is build big walls, big dams, and big defenses that not only protected that development, but actually encouraged others to move in and develop in these areas. This is the Shan Dam just near uh, Fergus as an example. But what we're realizing is that these defenses are no longer working. They're being overwhelmed by forces of climate change. And how we're realizing is we're starting to pay for it. So almost 80% of disaster assistance in Canada is consumed by flooding. Uh, flooding has replaced fire as the largest source of insurance claims in Canada. And believe it or not, every year we pay out of pocket almost $700 million to help pay for recovery from flood damage. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. I said from the beginning, natural, there's no such thing as a natural disaster if they are the result of policy decisions. So what does good policy look like in the era of climate change with regards to flood management? Increasingly, governments are turning to what might be perceived as a rather drastic action. We are planning retreats from the water. This is technically known as a managed retreat, a planned relocation of people and property away from a high-risk area to a safer area. This might seem a little extreme, and indeed, um, when we spoke to New York Times, our research team spoke to the New York Times about this, they asked a really good question. How is it that you plan on moving what could be thousands of people out of areas that may, they may have existed in for generations? Well, here we're fortunate that some jurisdictions have a lot of practice with facilitating managed retreats. So we know some of the major lessons um, that are involved. The first is, figure out where we're going to do it, right? So you've seen this map before. This shows riverine flood risk coming out of the floodplain right by Victoria Park locally. This shows a completely different type of flood risk. 
This is flood risk as a consequence of extreme rainfall. So this is urban flood risk. This is the risk that overwhelms storm sewers and, uh, and often ends up in your basement. These maps need to be combined, they need to be updated, and they need to be made publicly available. So we know where we need to convince people uh, to think about relocation. The second thing we need to do is tell people that they are at risk. We asked 2,300 Canadians living in high-risk areas in 2013 whether they in fact knew they lived in a high-risk area. The people on the bottom here, the ones with the indicated in the black bars, they got the question right. These people got the question wrong. Once we tell them that they are at risk, we then need to give them some good news. And we need to make sure that the quality of life that they are seeking after relocation meets that before relocation. So there are a couple things we can do here. First is make sure you have adequate compensation. More often than not, these people are going to be moving to areas with economic growth and higher property values. So make sure that we're paying these people a good deal for, for the property that they are giving up on. The second thing is to give them some hope. And this is really interesting. So this is a strategy out in Louisiana. And what they're doing is instead of focusing on just the areas that need to relocate, they're identifying what are known as receding communities. These are areas with high economic growth. They're proximate to areas targeted for relocation. And this is what I, I want to end uh, on today, is thinking about ourselves here a little bit in terms of a place for relocation. The areas that invest heavily in climate change resilience, adaptation, and flood risk management are going to become islands for these climate migrants. They're going to bring their families, they're going to bring their ideas, and they're going to bring their investments. Now, we're off to a good start here in Waterloo Region. This is, the, this is the results of a 2018 study we conducted where we compare and evaluate 63 different municipal climate change plans across the country. And we did quite well. But you can see, there's a lot of competition. And so we need to keep working on climate change adaptation, climate resilience. And so I started today with the question of where will we go when the water comes? And I'd like to end with another question. Why not here? Welcome to February, everyone. At the beginning of the new year is the time when we all make resolutions to change our bad habits and introduce better and new ones. Many of our resolutions are, of course, personal choices. They're about personal choices. Things like eating less, having fewer glasses of wine each evening. Maybe I'm speaking personally. Going to yoga or to the gym more often. These days, many of us are also making resolutions to change our habits in relation to the environment. Things like driving less, recycling more, trying to use less energy. But why are we doing that? Uh, we hope that by changing our individual habits, that we might, and this is all kind of taken together with the changes that everyone else makes, that this might have a big impact on the climate. But it turns out that habits can be hard to change. Many of us have likely already given up on the resolutions we made just a month ago, or can't even remember what habits we hoped we would change. That's what I'm talking about myself, perhaps. I want to answer a simple question tonight in relation to this question of habits. Is a change in our individual habits the best way to change, to address climate change? Do small changes have big impacts in the way that we might hope or expect that they do. The habits that I've been particularly interested in in my research and that I want to talk about tonight have to cons are concerned with our use of energy. Are there ways to change how, why, and when we each use energy? 
and so reduce the impact of energy use on the environment by changing how we each consume energy. Now, studies of habit have been conducted in a wide range of fields. It's one of the places researchers turn in order to explain gaps in processes of change. When it comes to climate change, one of the gaps that's often analyzed is between knowledge and action. Why knowing you should do something doesn't always mean that you will do it. In a 1993 essay, the scholar uh, Lauren Lipsenheiser reported that the role of habit, this is in his words, the role of habit in energy use has received little attention from energy researchers since persons in modern cultures are expected to know consciously what they're doing. In the, in the uh, almost three decades since then, analyses of the intersection of habit and energy have grown enormously, with studies attending to an enormous range, range of topics, such as patterns of air conditioning used by office workers, or ways of spatial knowing linked to different forms of mobility, or whether one uses low energy settings on their appliances. In relation to energy, the aim of studying habit is to figure out how individuals might be made to use less energy as part of their everyday lives. And then once again, we have this idea that scaling up these individual changes to habit might have a very big impact on overall energy use. What studies find, however, is that it turns out to be very hard to change energy habits. Studies have found that even when people are confronted with the shortcomings of their energy habits, they tend to remain committed to them. Studies have found that all too often reductions in energy use adopted by users during the study come to an end at its conclusion. That is, users go back to using the energy exactly the way that they did before the study. Now, it's not impossible to change habit, but studies of habit suggest that mere, mere awareness of the need for change doesn't always translate into long-term behavioral change. Part of the problem is that habit can be a tricky thing to study in the right way. Habit is actually not a very precise term. We use this term as part of our everyday life and most often with a value judgment attached to it. We praise our children when they develop good habits, and we scold them about habits they develop that we see as bad. We want to turn our, our own bad habits into good habits. When, and when we can't, we often imagine it's due to a fault of our own. But it's not just that these value judgments, it's not just that these, val these value judgments that get in the way. Habits tend to be studied um, as individual actions and tendencies. All the things we call habits, however, are actually embedded in a whole set of life practices and activities. Instead of looking at isolated actions, the field of practice theory has looked at how people use energy and impact the environment by exploring the full complexity of everyday individual and social behavior. What constitutes practice, as opposed to habit, are the deep and detailed circumstances of daily life within which all of us live. One of the most famous studies uh, in practice theory concerns changes that have developed recently about how we shower. Over a relatively short period of time in the United Kingdom, People switch from infrequent cold showers, about two per week, to daily hot showers, so a hot shower every single day. A small change with a big impact. It doesn't do much at this point to tell people to just take fewer hot showers than they once did in order to save the planet. Why might that be the case? These new practices that people start to develop quickly become a part of normal life linked to things like comfort, a sense of cleanliness, and even kind of what sociality is about. All of which speak to expectations of how to properly be an individual in society today. Even something as simple as our showering habits have a lot coded into them. Practice theory's reworking of how we understand energy and environmental consumption means that any narrow focus on habit is perhaps not the place to make significant changes in our impact on the Earth's environment. Instead of paying attention to individual autonomous and discretionary habits, practice theory insists that we pay attention to the larger social systems that shape our habits. Indeed, all too often a narrow attention on habit tends to disavow the necessity of systemic change and places the onus on the ethics of individual choice 
positioning how we use energy in a zone of moralizing and demand-based solutions. I guess what I'm trying to say is that a focus on habit, I think something that we all tend to bring on ourselves, something that actually is part of also a academic study, a focus on habit distracts us from big picture questions that need to be asked about climate change, the kind of questions that my colleagues here tonight have been asking. This includes big changes to infrastructure that individuals on their own can't do anything about. For example, you might want to drive less and take transit more. I certainly want to do that. But being able to change your habit, change that habit, it depends on the existence of transit in your community. Transit that is readily accessible, convenient, and affordable. So don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't change um, our energy habits, each and every one of us. But I'm saying that changes in energy use can take place without a look at the bigger picture, at the social cultural forces, and yes, political and economic ones, that shape how we behave, and what we can do, and what we can't. Which brings me back that we have a conclusion to New Year's resolutions. The Government of Canada's Sustainable Development Office kicked off the year by posting, in their words, quote, a commitment board for Canadians to share what they're doing for the environment and sustainable development. The Canadian government shouldn't be worried about collecting our individual resolutions. It should be telling us instead about its own resolutions to invest in alternative energy, mass transit infrastructure, low energy housing, and more. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the presentations this uh, this evening, and, and I also hope that amid the climate crisis, that you were able to identify some positive responses to challenges um, that were presented, to change the perspectives, approaches, and behaviors um, that exist to address the challenges posed by climate change. So impacts from climate change are real, and they're actually happening now, as you could see from some of the presentations. Beyond average long term increases in temperature, we're seeing impacts to ecosystems and on communities. Systems that we rely on, water, of course, uh, but also food, energy, transportation, agriculture, just to name a few, they're all being impacted. And as demonstrated, hopefully, this evening, it is important that climate change impacts and solutions be addressed in an integrated, interdisciplinary way, where various experts and, and perspectives and dis, uh, disciplinary expertises can contribute. Ultimately, however, um, it will also be up to all of us as citizens to embrace positive change and to influence our governments, our businesses, to take the necessary steps to reverse this crisis. So I want to take the opportunity here once again to thank our seven researchers for sharing their perspectives with us tonight. And I also would like to thank the museum for hosting us here tonight and also on their recent opening of the important alarm exhibition that you can see here uh, still tonight, which through art is compelling us to take action. And finally, I want to thank you all for coming and showing up um, here tonight uh, for attending this event. And we want to invite you to, to join us uh, for refreshments in the back of the atrium um, and to explore the museum until 9 p.m. I think we've got another 40 minutes or so to go. So once again, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Thank you.